to welcome Andy Gibson, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Hello. I'm Andy. I'm from the internet. Uh, it's nice to see some other people from the internet here today. Nice to, at, at Kev up north, nice to meet you. Um, any other people I've just known from Twitter, nice to see you in, in first life um, today. Um, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I am here to talk to you a little bit about uh, education and technology. But I, I'm not from an institutional background. I don't work in FE or HE. I'm coming at this from, I guess, the perspective of being a kind of, I don't know, a social entrepreneur, if, if for want of a better word. But I, I'm interested in taking all of the cool tools of new technologies and applying them to social problems and trying to make the world a better place. Um, and so I start businesses which aim not only to make money, but also to change the world for the better, because obviously making businesses that just make money is far too easy. You know, everyone's cracked that one. So let's make it even more complicated. Um, <clears throat> so I uh, have previously uh, co-founded School of Everything, as you heard, which I'll tell you a little bit about, more about that. And uh, I guess my, my interest is in <coughs> Uh, how uh, we can use technologies to connect ourselves together so that we can uh, take simple actions collectively which in total adds up to big change. And so I'm going to talk to you for about 20 minutes and I want to also have a chance for you to shout questions at me because it seems a little bit uh, kind of unweb too for me to just lecture at you. It seems like I can need to take my own medicine a bit. You get to talk too. I am not the teacher here. And there's also the, the wonderful Twitter back channel, so you can say nasty things about me behind my back, which is always fun. Uh, so, uh, I, I'm interested in web two, um, which basically, I mean, we all have a general understanding of what web two is. Uh, essentially, web one came out, made quite a lot of money, as they tend to do. They thought, let's make a sequel. Uh, they didn't really have much of a sense of a new plot for this sequel. They just thought, well, we'll basically do the same thing again, but, you know, with, with more explosions. Um, and so Web 2, actually, I think the best way of thinking about it is if, if Web 1 was connecting people to information, then Web 2 is uh, connecting people to other people. And actually, that's there from the origins of the Internet. That's really what the Internet is about. It's not some kind of big, spangly new thing. It's simply about noticing that the power of the Web is not just to give us better brochures or access to uh, an encyclopedia. It's actually, to take the Wikipedia example, it's not about being able to access an encyclopedia, it's about everybody who's ever contributed something to an encyclopedia being connected together to write one together. It's that interconnectivity of human beings that is the important bit. And that's what my, my work mostly focuses on. And so I uh, set out back in 2006 with a, a group of my friends to apply these principles to education. And, uh, and that was quite fun. Uh, we didn't necessarily succeed, but um, uh, as, uh, as a wise person once said, the, the secret of life is not to learn from your mistakes. Any idiot can do that. The secret is to learn from other people's. Uh, and so allow me to share my failures with you so that you can learn from what we did wrong. Um, but we also got a few things right. So let me tell you a little bit about the background of School of Everything. School of Everything .com uh, was, we, although it's a dot com, we talked about it as being the start of the dot org boom. If you'd had a dot com boom in the 90s of people trying to sell more shoes uh, on the internet, then we were going to be the dot org boom that would use the internet to improve our lives and, and transform society. And the idea for School of Everything, well, it came from various different sources. For, for me, it, it, uh, it started as so many things do in life with a, a glamorous Parisian aristocrat who I'd fallen in love with. And uh, uh, I really wanted to learn French, and quickly, really quickly. And I wanted to learn a specific type of French, which was that I kept going to dinner parties with all of her posh friends, and I didn't understand what the hell they were talking about. And so I had a very specific learning need. And so being the kind of awkward, unreasonable person that I am, I didn't go and seek out a, a, a course doing French. What I did was I said, right, let's find a French teacher that uh, a friend of mine says is really good and get her into my office and get a whole bunch of people I know who want to learn the same kind of French and we'll run a class in our office. And so we actually ended up running two classes. We had a beginners and advanced and we were kind of learning French after work once a week. And it was cheaper than what we'd have got from going to a local course and it was also very tailored to what we needed. And during the course of doing that, I started saying, well, where's the tool to organize this? You know, we, we actually need something to help us to make this work more efficiently. We shouldn't be 
relying on you know bunches of ten pound notes to pay. We shouldn't necessarily have to rely on the people that we have in our office to organise this. We should be able to do this better if we can use the internet. Um, and I met, I met uh, the, the other School of Everything co-founders. There are five of us, actually. Um, uh, most of us with beards. We did at one point get called the Taliban of technology, which I'm not sure if I'm that proud of, but still, it's quite funny. Um, and uh, what, what they told me um, was a couple of things. One was the work of Ivan Illich and de-skilling society, which I'm sure most of you will be familiar with, and the learning networks. And he posited an idea back in, in the early 70s that you could build a machine that would, uh, you could write on, on a card what it is that you wanted to teach or learn and insert it into the machine and the machine would give you back a card with somebody near you who could either teach you it or, or, or wants to learn what you know. Um, so the idea was, was there quite early on and there was an experiment with the learning exchange based on that in, in America which tried to do exactly that and with, with phone networks. So there was a sort of legacy to this. And the story that really inspired us was uh, uh, back in the early 60s uh, in Palo Alto. Uh, there were a group of uh, activists and academics who were loosely affiliated to Stanford University who wanted to learn uh, a load of things that Stanford didn't teach, which ranged from everything from yoga through to radical Marxist politics. And uh, also quite a lot of computing stuff. Some of the early conversations about how do we learn to build and uh, build computers and program computers came out in these conversations. And so they started a notice board in their local shop uh, where they would post up what they wanted to learn. If enough people signed up to want to learn it too, then uh, they would find a room somewhere and find a teacher or, or teach themselves, and they would hold a class. And it got to the point where this notice board, which was called the Free University, or Free U, uh, had more students enrolled in it than Stanford, and over a 1,000 courses happening all across the, the town. Um, and what actually came of that, I mean, it got, like so many of these radical experiments, it got taken over by radical Marxists, um, and sort of became quite a niche thing. So it didn't actually work as a long-term experiment for building a new infrastructure, but it was a community of people teaching and learning together. It was incredibly successful. And some of the people who were loosely involved in that went on to be involved in the Homebrew Computing Club and spawned Apple Computers, you know, the, the Home Computing Revolution, which ultimately gives birth to the internet. So there's, there's a legacy of the history of the internet, which is in this radical education space, this idea that actually what we're learning is too... Is, is evolving too quickly to be taught in the traditional way. So what we need to do is to teach each other and, and do it in a more informal way. Um, how's Twitter doing? <laughs> Rescued by Illich reference, excellent. Um, old school technology, that's what we need. Um, so essentially what we looked at, we looked at the free you and we said, well, if you were going to do that today, you'd use the internet. And actually, if we do that on the internet, that could be huge. If we can get a thousand courses going just from a notice board in a shop, what could you do if you apply the principles of Wikipedia to it? And so we set off on this journey to, <coughs> I guess, to reorganize education. And we had a great time. Uh, we, we got in the papers, we raised, you know, like three quarters of a million pounds of other people's money, which we spent on things that we didn't entirely understand, but my God, they liked it. You know, the abstract people who we seem to be wanting to impress. So ministers referenced us in speeches as being a success, and Gordon Brown gave us an award. And, uh, and we got a large community of people who were all signing up to this thing, and a big, you know, a big sort of movement around the brand, of people saying, this is fantastic, this is brilliant, this is going to change everything, what a brilliant idea, what a simple idea. This is going to, this is going to be huge. And yet somehow, in the middle of all that, we, we didn't quite manage to turn our big brand story about the education revolution into a really useful thing that one person could use and it would actually improve their lives. We had this very, very grand narrative. And then slowly, over the course of time, that narrative started to unravel because what we built didn't <coughs> quite deliver on the big story that we had. And there are a few reasons for that. And I think one of the things that we got right is that uh, the internet isn't just a virtual space for us to remove ourselves from reality. And that, I think, is the key insight that I, I still feel very passionate about from the School of Everything project, is that at the time when everyone was talking about e-learning in the context of how to replace classrooms and replace face-to-face -face interactions like this one, when universities were starting to build campuses in second life, we were talking about first life. We were saying, actually, the power of the internet is that it can tell you who knows what in your building. And actually, if you can find out more about the people around you, you will probably find that 
between all of you, you know a great deal more than you thought. And there may be somebody who's walking past you in the street every day or lives downstairs who happens to be an expert in the thing that you are really curious about. And that, I think, is bearing fruit in the sense that what we've seen since then, what you've got to bear in mind when we started, this was 2006, so we, we launched before Facebook went public. And so a lot of what we were doing was kind of very sketchy. We didn't know whether this stuff would work. And this was a long time before all of the kind of the Arab Spring and the sort of sense that the internet was going to have a positive social benefit. So we were sort of slightly out on a limb trying to experiment with this stuff. And what we've seen since then actually bears out this notion that, you know, where is Second Life now? Actually, what's happening with all, these, all this virtual world? What we're discovering is that what we really like is to use the internet to find people. So actually, the, for me, the interesting thing about the web is that, you know, I just met at Kev up north, um, who uh, you know I'd met on Twitter before. And actually, after this conference is over, you guys will be able to follow me on Twitter in perhaps a slightly creepy way. And 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 that's quite interesting because it means we can continue our relationship after the face-to-face -face experience of it. And so it's it's actually that that's what people are using the web for. They're using it to find each other and to have relationships with each other. So we got that right. What we got wrong is that we then approached building the tool as if it was a classic product development piece. And this is a kind of key learning, I think, for people who are looking to build technology to facilitate education. Is that We talked about building a marketplace. We talked about you know, this is actually a, a, an inefficient market. What we should be able to do is the problem w w for, for both teachers and learners is we don't necessarily get to teach and learn exactly the thing that we're passionate about. There are a lot of independent music teachers who are teaching people chopsticks to people who don't want to learn chopsticks. And actually, there's probably enough people who are really passionate about learning the piano parts of Dark Side of the Moon um, for that, that teacher to be able to teach exactly the, their favourite album. And you know, actually, where, how do we get that kind of very granular stuff? And we got we got we got it right in the sense that there was a gap there. We, actually, we could have we could have found each other better. But we approached building the tool as if it was a straightforward product design. So if you think about how you would design a a glass of water. The standard product design methodology for this is that you, you interview users. You, you talk to people about how they're using water and what kind of vessel they want. I mean, obviously you don't because we figured this one out. But to, to, to follow this kind of slightly silly analogy that actually there are lots of ways you can change this. So you might find out that some people like thinner glass and, and thicker glass. Some people are clumsy and drop it. So you might need something with a robust base. Actually, some people kind of knock things. So actually maybe you need it to be kind of heavier than normal. Maybe you don't. Maybe you, people like different sizes, different, different uh, shapes of it. And there's the aesthetic quality as well. And all of these things you can find out from engaging in, in one person's experience of drinking water from a glass. And you make a glass that they like, and then you go, right, who else likes this glass? And you find a bunch of people who also like the same thing. You tweak it, you tweak it, you tweak it until you've got a big market, and you sell lots and lots of glasses because you've designed it brilliantly. This is obviously what Apple did brilliantly. They, you know, they design something that one person likes, and then they see how many other people like it, and they keep evolving it until suddenly they have something that a million people will buy on the first day because they know their market and they design a product for it. But what we, what we got wrong is that teaching is not a product. Learning is not a product, which, of course, should be perfectly self-evident to most of you. <laughs> um, but we kind of got caught up in that, that story about how we were going to become millionaires. And actually, teaching is a relationship. Right? Education is a very relational business. And it can't be reduced to a product that can be bought and sold in the same way as eBay. And so our analogy was, we're going to build eBay for learning. But actually, the thing about eBay is that when you buy you know, a second-hand car from somebody, you don't need to have a relationship with that person. And actually, the purpose of money and commerce is to be able to give us a relationship with people that's very, very light touch so we can just exchange things. And teaching and learning is a very personal process. And so we built these tools that would connect us all together. And then we said, right, we'll handle all the transactions. And then the teachers went, well, we, we just take money at the end of it. And actually, people just owe us because they're our friends, because we teach them every week. You know? and, it's actually, why would, we, why would we want to use this rather impersonal tool to, to, to sort out what is actually just an aspect of our relationship with our students? And so we've ended up, I guess, building something that was more and more focused around the teachers and helping teachers find new students. And what we completely missed is the notion of building new relationships between learners and helping learners to come together and say, right, we all want to learn this, let's find a teacher and, and actually doing it the other way around. And 
to take it from, to a more abstract level, there's a great quote by Christopher Alexander, an architect about the pattern language, who had this lovely sort of throwaway line about education, which has guided a lot of what I've said since, um, which is that he said, a, a society that is structured around learning tends towards freedom. A society that is structured around teaching tends towards fascism. <coughs> Quite a challenging thing for, you know, for teachers, I and mean, both my parents were teachers, and I'm kind of... I have a lot of sympathy for you know, the importance of being a good teacher. But I think, I think all of us can agree that actually the end product is that someone should learn something, that actually that's what it's about. And whatever we can do to facilitate someone to be able to learn whatever it is that they want to learn, that's really the thing that changes the world. That's the exciting bit. And we are just facilitators of that. And actually, if we were going to really take this logic through, then what we should have said is we want to be able to build a tool that enables anyone to take control of their own learning, to learn exactly what they want, in the way that they want, where they want, in the most efficient way possible. And instead, we built, we built something that was helping driving instructors and yoga teachers to get more students, which, although it was, kind of, it was useful to them, actually, we kind of missed the problem. The problem with education is not it's really hard to find a yoga teacher in Google. That's not a problem that needed solving. We spent a lot of money trying to solve a problem that already had been figured out by the internet. And actually, that's the problem with, with a lot of web startups now. Don't rebuild the internet. The internet's good. It works very well. There's lots of things you can do on it. And we tried to rebuild a lot of the internet. So I think that, that was kind of one big lesson for us, is that actually what we should have been doing is designing to support conversations. So really, if we were going to build technology that improved the relationships between teachers and learners, we should really have got a whole bunch of teachers and a whole bunch of their prospective students into a room together and got them all drunk and listened to what they said to each other and figured out what was really good about those interactions when they're in a room together and then said, right, let's build some software that enables everybody to have the same quality of conversation when they're distributed as when they're all in a room. And we would have built something completely different to the, the eBay for learning marketplace that we built. We would probably have built something a little bit more like brain dating, sort of match.com, teach.com, um, because actually it's about finding each other. Making sense? No one in the wrong room? <laughs> Good. So, um, I don't know, how long have we got? So, I, I want to ask, I want to take a few questions, but I want to just, just say um, before that a little bit about, I guess, what we've, what we've done since. Uh, and actually, one of the big lessons for me is that I've kind of decided I don't really like technology. I think technology is a pain. Um, not to say that I want to live without it, um, but, but what I think is we should have less technology rather than more. The, the, the utopian vision should not be we want to have more and more hover cars. Um, what we actually want is things that work, and the simpler the better. Because one of the things that bugs me about science fiction movies is that the technology always works, right? You get a hover car and it just drives. It's not reality. That's not a realistic vision of the future. There's a team of hover car engineers that come out and go, oh, God, yeah, this one's broken the same way as the last one. This model always does this, mate. You know, this is real. I, I hate my job. I used to be a printer. <laughs> and that's, what, that's, that, that's the reality of it. And there's, there's a very interesting... Uh, okay, I guess model for thinking about technology is just a continuum of online and offline tools that actually whiteboards are useful, tables are more useful, glasses for water are useful, it's all technology. And so in my new project, Mind Apples, which we're asking what's the time of day for your mind, and encouraging everyone to take better care of their mental health in a positive way, this is actually the technology we ended up with. <laughs> That's our website, right? <laughs> because we built a website that asked everybody what five things do you do that are good for your mind. And then we thought, well, actually, websites aren't as fun as building a giant tree installation and taking it on tour around music festivals. So we built a website that was actually a giant wooden tree with some, with some apple cards. And then we uploaded these onto our website. So actually, it's not really about technology. It's about people. And it's about finding a new way for us to interact. Um, and actually, I want to get away from this notion of technology as efficiency by which we mean the kind of the self-service checkouts in Sainsbury's where actually we've just fired a bunch of people who we used to buy groceries from and replaced them with a robot. That's not very fun. I don't really like that future of technology. We have this very industrial model of technology and actually it's not about replacing human beings with machines. The lesson from Wikipedia is not that we can build a massive computer that will figure out all the knowledge of the world and then synthesize it. That is the lesson of Google. 
You know, that's very useful, very effective. But the lesson from Wikipedia is the most powerful computer is the human brain. And if you connect all of those together, you get something that's much more efficient, actually. Wikipedia spent a lot less money than Google. So I just want to take a couple of questions. We've got, we've got a couple of minutes left. So I just wanted to see. Yes. Yes. I've got a question for you about what you see as the role of educational organisations and institutions within the model that you're describing. Because it seems to me it's very centred around what individuals want, yeah. either teachers or students. And where do you see universities and colleges yeah. in that picture? So where, where do I see universities and colleges and institutions in this, in this model that's centred around the, the, the learner is the question. Um, I, would, I would say that uh, what, what was perceived initially as a kind of challenge to those institutions, I think we meant it as a nice challenge in that you sort of actually you know, you're in a position to care about this and to do something about it. I think that where we should end up is a situation where people can be much more independent in, in meeting their own learning needs, but you guys should be in the best place to provide those facilities. And what, what I was trying to do with School of Everything was create a curiosity engine, really, get people really, really interested in stuff, because actually that's driving demand for anybody who's got the skills, the facilities to be able to teach. So maybe it means changing the relationship with the teachers and with the learners and seeing it more as a network, but that's going on in all businesses, that actually our ex-staff, our funders, our partners are all becoming part of the map of the organisation chart because technology is kind of breaking out the borders of it. But it does mean that there will be hopefully more people who want to use facilities for teaching and learning. It would mean that potentially you've got people who are teaching a niche subject and you don't necessarily need to be employing them full time. You can provide facilities for them, take the cut and they, they can run their own business. You get the sort of, you get the long tail of, of kind of all the different learning subjects becoming something that you can host rather than that you have to feel that you've got to deliver. And that's where I see the future of institutions is being teaching and learning platforms, really being able to make this the best place to learn and teach. So everybody in this huge distributed market wants to knock on their door going, can I come and use your facilities? Can I come and you know, buy this teacher because he's great? Well, I think the challenges for institutions is that the reputation system starts to become about the individual teachers. And that's a challenge for teachers. We start to get rated. And that's quite scary. Right? You know. So you get people turning up at your door going, I want to study at your institution, but only if you can put this person and this person on my course. You know. And we need to figure out what to do about that. Um, one more question. Yeah. Just following on from Shell's question then, and, and your answer, do you therefore envisage the, um, the extinction of existing universities and colleges and then be replaced by a much more agile and um, you know, much more able to deliver what you're talking about? Because clearly existing institutions cannot deliver what you're talking about. So will they be replaced by new institutions that can actually do that? So will, will universities and other existing institutions be replaced by new institutions? I think the... I, I, don't, I don't have a full answer to that. I think the, the one we haven't discussed is qualifications. <clears throat> I think the big question for universities is, are they going to be accrediting people with a stamp to say you've learnt this to this standard? <coughs> or, or are they going to be platforms for a more free-form type of teaching and learning? I think the intersection of that could be quite interesting. I think we might end up with a sort of music exams model with a whole with the, 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 the actual process of teaching and learning is much more independent, uncontrolled and in the hands of the learners, but there are institutions who accredit the learners' work and say, you actually now have a qualification, you have a degree, you've met the standards. So I think universities as custodians of standards still feels like a very important part of the process. What I don't know is how, it's, how easy it will be to balance being custodians of the standards with being completely learner-driven in terms of what you let people learn because it's, it's actually two different roles in the system. So that, it may be that those have to split out. But that's the point. Who knows, right? Who knows? Um, I think we're, we're pretty much at time. Um, thank you for a couple of questions. Uh, I, I, will, I will follow up on Twitter as well, so do tweet me on at Gander. And just to sort of, sort of summarise what I'm saying, I think let's talk about beer. Um, so I used to describe what I do as uh, like the bottom of a beer glass. The answer to life is at the bottom of a beer glass, it's official. And I don't know if you've ever looked on lager glasses, they have this cross hatching. And actually, uh, the champagne flutes do the same thing. They have a little cross hatching on the bottom. And the purpose of that is that it makes it more fizzy. And it does that because there's all of this energy caught up in the liquid. 
and it doesn't really have anywhere to focus, so it just kind of stays in the liquid in, 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 in solution. But if you give a little groove on the, on the base of the glass, then that gives the energy in, in the water, in the, in the liquid, a place to coalesce and to form bubbles and then fire off. And that's what I see my work as being about. In this room, there are a whole bunch of things that each of you wants to do. There's all this energy, there's all these skills. And actually, a lot of the things that you really, really want to do, you haven't got the opportunity to do it. And so if I can find simple technologies, tools, rallying points, which will enable you to do something that you always wanted to do, but you haven't had a chance to do it before, then collectively, we can do something really cool. And who knows, maybe one day I might get rich off it. <laughs> and thank you very much for your time. <laughs>